All right. McInerney, Chapter 3, Ultimate End and Moral Principles. So what did we think of this chapter? Any beginning thoughts anywhere we want to start? Overall thoughts you might have had, or also questions, anything to clarify? Now, something I'll say from the outset. Um, this may be something I should have maybe clarified uh, earlier in the semester as well, is that I, uh, if there's ever anything in any of these readings that you have trouble understanding, whether it's terminology, whether it's the way that he phrases something, or something that he's referring to, or anything like that, that you don't understand, it's not a dumb question to ask. Even if I otherwise would not address it, the reason I probably wouldn't address a lot of these things is because I speak this language. Right? This, is, this is sort of the, the kind of stuff that I'm constantly in the middle of. And so when you read something and don't get it, I might assume that you do because I do. And that's a mistake on my part. Um, just because this is the kind of thing that I'm always doing, so it's it's hard for me to see it. It's like a, you know, a, you know, a fish in water doesn't realize that it's wet, kind of thing. And so I will naturally have some trouble figuring out exactly what it is that you might not understand about these topics. And so if there is anything like that, always feel free to bring it up and not to think that it's a dumb question because it's a real it's a question that I don't realize that I need to clarify in a lot of cases. So always feel free to do so. Yeah. It seems that throughout all the chapters, he keeps bringing up the same point where you do human action because you ultimately want to attain a goal. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm so, I'm starting to not see points anymore. <laughs> like he's repeated it so much that every new point that he brings in just sounds vaguely similar to all the other ones. Sometimes mm -hmm. he just, it sounds like he's repeating himself from a previous chapter. Okay, I see what you mean. Um, there are certainly some points of repetition here. But what he's doing here is, is kind of expanding out in different directions, I think, from that central point. Because that is the central point. You've got it absolutely right. What he wants to get across is this idea that human action is a certain kind of thing. Uh, a good example of this, if we go to, where is it? The part where he talks about sex, if I can find it. OK. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, uh, um, let's see. Because he talks about, uh, he, he uses sex as, as an example. Uh, and it's where I think he, he states this principle quite clearly. Um, because he wants to, wants to talk about things that we do as part of our nature that we can only possibly do in a particularly human sort of way. So he says uh, down here, right? So and this is starting around the, the middle of this paragraph. So as, as human, the pursuit of these given goods must be rational, deliberate, and responsible. That, that mantra of rational, deliberate, responsible should be very familiar at this point. He's, he never stops saying this, as you kind of noticed. So again, rational here means that it is the kind of thing that, is, uh, that it is for a particular end. We are thinking about it, and we are pursuing it for some reason. Deliberate, we have thought it through. We are we're understanding of the situation that's going on and what we are choosing. Responsible meaning free, basically. That, that it's, we are responsible for the action, in other words. Responsible here, again, this is important, especially in this section to note. Responsible here does not carry the connotation of you know, acting responsibly, like doing the right thing. Not exactly what he's getting at. It's kind of it's shallower or simpler than that. Responsible just means that we are responsible for our actions. Okay. <clears throat> he says natural law is not simply the rational recognition of physical imperatives, nor is it a judgment of how we should act, which ignores the given teleology of the physical. So what does he mean by that? This is where he's starting to expand on this idea. And this is why I point this out. Anybody get what he means there? So does anyone remember the particular context of this discussion? No? So this is where he was talking about the naturalistic fallacy, or the so-called naturalistic fallacy. Ring any bells? So one of the, uh, one of the primary criticisms of, of natural law as an ethical theory is this idea that 
it commits what's called the naturalistic fallacy, which is that it only is describing things as they happen and saying because things happen in a certain way that that is the natural way that things ought to go about. And so basically it's just saying that it is reducing ethics to a rote description of how things work, right? I mean, that it's tautological, in other words. But McInerney is saying here that because natural law is not simply the rational recognition of physical imperatives, that there is more to it than simply this is in fact what happens. Right? There is a uh, there is an ought, there is a should, there is a this is the right way for things to go, not just this is the way that things go. It goes on, nor is it a judgment of how we should act which ignores the given teleology of the physical. So the, so the physical here, meaning, you know, particularly he's talking about our animal selves, right? So if we think back to the what makes good rat and we think of the, the yes, I know, this, uh, this actually does have some significance that we as rational animals build upon the animal parts of ourselves, that we do these naturalistic sorts of things like, like eating and uh, like reproducing and like sensation and like moving ourselves around and stuff like that, but we do it in a uniquely human way. And because we do it in a uniquely human way, um, that means that we are capable of recognizing things about it and choosing how to do it. Okay, so he goes on. Natural law relates to inclinations other than reason, which have their own ends by prescribing how we should humanely or humanly, sorry, pursue them. So <clears throat> it relates to inclinations other than reason. So it's talking about those animal things that we do. But it's prescriptive. In other words, it tells us how to act and how, more importantly, how to choose to act in this particularly human way that he keeps talking about by looking at what those various animated, uh, animate and vegetative functions are for. It looks at, in other words, the teleology. Do we know what teleology means? I, I've mentioned this briefly, just as a reminder. You don't need to look this up. If you don't know, you can say that. I don't remember. I know I had divided before, I just don't remember. All right, that's fine. Then remember offhand, teleology. This is what I mean. This is one of those terms that is basically English to me, even though it's absolutely not English, it's literally Greek. So I, <laughs> I assume that you just sort of know what that means just sort of in passing, which I should not do, but yes. Got it? The explanation of phenomena is in terms of the purpose they serve rather than the cause by which they arise. Correct, so it's the end to which something is for. Right? So the teleology of something is what something is for, what something is aimed towards, rather than what brought it about. Right? So a stapler has a particular teleology, or a particular telos, or a particular end, which is stapling things. This is very different from its manufacturer swing line. Right? It says it on here. I picked this one because it has the manufacturer on it. Um, the other one is made by Oh, Office Depot, it's on the bottom, look at that. Anyway, but these, despite having different manufacturers, being manufactured of different material in different ways, etc., they are different in that respect, but their teleology is the same. They're both for stapling things, right? And so when we, when we judge things, just like when we judge actions, we're judging them in terms of what they are for, primarily. And so these actions that we pursue, which are not themselves strictly rational, insofar as they are they're, they're actions that we perform as animals, so to speak, we also perform them as humans because we can be aware of their teleology and we can order that teleology towards our greater ends. Okay. He says, for Thomas, natural law is a dictate of reason, not a physical law. It is by coming under the guidance of reason that goods which are not peculiar to man come to be constituents of the human good. So when reason is guiding these lower things that we do, these animal things that we do, broadly speaking, then they become constitutive of the human good. They are then we, we by choosing them in this particular way, uh, you know, rational, deliber rationally, deliberately, responsibly, we organize or order these ends towards our higher rational human ends. Okay, so then he gives the example. 
sex is a human good, not just as such. So it's not just, it's a human good because it produces certain animal ends, right? Whether that's the goods of sensation, so the animal ends of sensation, so pleasure, et cetera, um, and not just the vegetative ends of reproduction, but also, he goes on to say, but insofar as it is engaged in consciously, purposively, and responsibly. So we take these lower ends that, the, that in this case, the act of sex possesses, and we, write, we raise that up to our human purposes and not merely to the animal purposes. It is a human good based on how we organize it in the context of our overall, uh, our overall structure of choices, let's say. Now he goes on, that is how it becomes a human evil too. So we can choose to do it the right way or choose to do it the wrong way. Just like anything else we can choose. And that's the key. Anything that we choose, even the merely animal things that we do, right? eating, sleeping, etc., whatever, we can do rightly or we can do wrongly because it, is, it becomes a definitively human action by our pursuing it in a definitively human way, which is what he was getting at by this, uh, this, uh, this categorization that he was talking about earlier in, in chapter one. He says, there is no way in which humans can engage in sexual activity other than deliberately, which is why the animal part of our nature is always a part, but never autonomous. Okay, so that part, let's take from end to beginning. Let's pick this apart. But I think this is, again, I think a good um, illustration of how he's sort of taking this core idea and then going in different places with it, sort of applying how, how natural law applies to and, try, and figures into considerations of human action as he's been discussing. So he says, the animal part of our nature is always a part, never autonomous. What is he getting at there? What's he mean? It's done deliberately. Mm -hmm. So we have conscious when doing it, like we are doing it on purpose. It's not not always instinctual to do it. Yeah, so it's never autonomous. In other words, it's right, our animality, right? Our animal ends, our merely animal ends, or vegetative ends for that matter. We also have that, that lower part, which is nutrition and reproduction, the continuance of our, our biological lives. It's never autonomous insofar as it doesn't just happen on its own. We are always necessarily guiding its going on through our deliberate choices. Caveat though, kind of, because you can push back on this if you want. Think of eating. Right? You choose what to eat, right? Great. We all have done so today, I hope, right? We've all eaten at least something today. We chose to do so, presumably, even though that was you know, a drink of water or whatever it was, right? If you've chosen to eat today, you've chosen what to eat. That choice has the character of the human action, and hopefully it has the character of the good. It was some good that you were pursuing in a reasonable, temperate, uh, correct, just, healthy way, etc. But there's also part of that process which is not, strictly speaking, human action, which is what you're doing right now. What are you doing right now in terms of what you've eaten today? Digesting. Right. Now, are you doing so rationally, deliberately, and responsibly? Nope. No, not at all, not, none of those things. You are not, you are not, I guess I should say you're not um, you're not actively digesting, so to speak. I mean, you are. It's kind of going on. It's not. It hasn't stopped because you've stopped doing it. It's just sort of happening, and so it's not strictly speaking a human action. The stuff that your stomach is doing right now, and the rest of your digestive system, whatever, that is not. It's not strictly action. It's an event which is sort of occurring within you. And so these, these merely, let's say, vegetative parts of ourselves, right? Nutrition is a vegetative property. They are, 
in some sense directed by human action, but not totally and not completely. They are autonomous to some degree. They are directed by human action because we do choose what to eat. We choose nutrition. But we don't choose precisely how it gets digested. OK, so that's a caveat. But it's still worth noting that when we do, so that part of what I'm getting at is that part of this merely animal thing that we happen to do, that part of it, yeah, that part's autonomous. That does its own thing. But it's still guided and directed by human reason. And so it is part of the action that we choose to initiate and carry out. Right? We choose to eat and what to eat and when and in what context and how much and with whom and all that stuff. It makes it morally significant. OK, so it's never autonomous. Back to the next clause of the sentence. OK, which is why the animal part of our nature is always a part. So what does he mean by that part? By that our, the animal part of our nature is always a part of us. It's always a part of our nature. Put it another way, it's essential to our nature still. Part of what we are. What do you mean? What would be the alternative? Provide perhaps a hypothetical. If the animal aspects of ourselves were entirely autonomous from our, uh, they were not a part of our nature, but were something separate to it, then first of all, it would not be guided by human action. <clears throat> not directly. Uh, it would be as if it were a separate being that we were interacting with, so to speak. This would be the sort of ghost in the machine model, that we're a rational being stuck in a, you know, f fleshy thing. The alternative to this, in other words, is what's called Gnosticism. The idea that, that the material is something alien to ourselves. What he's getting at here and why he's emphasizing this is that we are intrinsically, innately, and unavoidably material in addition to being innately, intrinsically, and unavoidably rational. We are, in fact, both necessarily. You cannot separate the two without doing some irreparable, maybe irreparable, maybe not, but serious damage to the human nature, maybe even destroying it utterly. That's what death means, by the way. The separation of the rational from the rational from the material. Right? Body and soul, so to speak. Death, right? It's when the material stops functioning. So if it were not actually a part, if the animal nature were not actually a part of us, if it were something separate, that we do not guide and direct in this rational way, if it did operate entirely autonomously, it wouldn't be part of us. It would not be something of ethical concern to us. But it is. Right? Based on who and what we are, we are fundamentally not just rational, but also animal. And so it being a part of our nature and not just a mere thing that we interact with, it being a part of our nature means that necessarily when we do even these animal sorts of actions, they are still human actions, always necessarily. Okay, with me so far? Questions, clarifications, pretty good. All right, let's take it a step further back. He says, there is no way in which humans can engage in sexual activity other than deliberately. What does he mean by that? And uh, what are some perhaps um, incorrect interpretations of that that we might want to avoid? Because there are ways of misinterpreting this, I think. Things that he could mean, but does not. Or what is he talking about, either way? What are we getting at here? Sex can only be done willingly. And? Willingly and what? You were the one who asked about why does he keep repeating the same thing over and over, so willingly? Then there's two more. There we go, right? 
So it has to be uh, consciously, so we have to be aware of what we're doing. Deliberately means we have to think it through, and then responsibly, meaning we meaning willingly. It's, we're responsible for the action. That's what he means. That is the only circumstance in which we can possibly um, engage in sexual activity. Now, this is this could be taken in a few uh, a few incorrect ways. This could be taken to mean that that is the only correct way to engage in sexual activity. That's not right. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying here. I mean, he's not saying the obviously true thing that sex should only be engaged in in mutual consent, right? Yes, obviously true, not what he's getting at here, though, right? He's saying that if it is not free, uh, free, deliberate, and rational, then you're not engaging in it. The only way to do so is in this particularly uniquely human way. And so, necessarily, you're doing that right or you're doing that wrong because that's how human action works. Human action is the kind of thing that is either conducive to our ultimate end, is either in accordance with the natural law, or simply not. It's contrary to our ultimate end and fails to accord with the natural law. So what about cases that appear to be engagement in sexual activity that are not any or all of these things? What about cases where where, say, consent is murky or not present. Rape cases or, uh, or um, I mean, those are the, rape is the obvious case for this, right? So let's start with that and move on to maybe more complex cases. There's a reason we delineate being raped from having sex. Right? Aside from the moral character of it, again is obvious, but not quite the point we're getting at. And even aside from aside from the, the, the psychological and emotional impact of the two very different activities, we think of them as very different activities primarily because one is an action and one is an event. Or maybe we put it this way, one is your action and one is someone else's, right? If we even just think of it grammatically, one is active, one is passive. And so something that happens to us from an outside force is obviously not something that we are doing. It's not a, it's not a human action if we lose the ability to do anything about it one way or the other. And so this applies not just to sex, but to anything, right? This is why, say, being robbed is different from giving someone money. Uh, uh, maybe an off strange example of this, but um, there's a, uh, I am told at least, I don't go to New York City often, but I'm told that there's a common practice in New York City where someone will come up to you with uh, obviously armed, um, maybe not displaying it, but very obviously armed and corner you somewhere and say, hey, can I borrow 20 bucks? And then you give them 20 bucks. Now, did you give them money? Yes. No, they robbed you. Right? Right? You see why, though, right? Yeah, yeah. You have a choice. Right. The implication was that they're not actually borrowing money from you. Yeah. Right? That was what they said, but it was clearly not what they intended. Their action was the morally significant action. Their action was the human action. Your action was, if anything, a, a um, what, what McInerney, the, another of those Latin terms that, that is normal for me, but might not be for you. When he says peace aller, P-I-S-A-L-L-E-R, right? that, that means a choice that we make, uh, which is the best of a limited range of alternatives. Something like that. Um, it means, uh, literally, um, basically it means, well, there's nothing else, right? There's no alternative. So yeah, it's the best option that we have given the circumstances that you know, you're being robbed. I mean, your alternative might be defend yourself, but under the circumstances that may or may not be beneficial. I mean, if it's give me your wallet and you've got $5 in your wallet and let's suppose you have a gun, but that gun is, ro is loaded with bullets that cost more than $5 each, you know, maybe the wallet. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not even really 
kitty, right? Kind of a joke, but it's also like it's also one of those deliberations where, you know, really, what are my options here? If your options are limited, then if your if your options are limited sufficiently, then that takes away the aspect of voluntariness. Right? The, your responsibility is mitigated in an action like that because it's not quite a fully human action. That's what I'm getting at. And so, if your responsibility is mitigated partially or fully, that action becomes less and less human until it is not an action at all at some point. Now, where that line is drawn, where it goes from an action to not an action even slightly, can be questionable. That can be murky. Because if we're going from the extreme, in terms of going back to the question of, of sex and when engaging in sexual activity is a human action and when it's not, there are obvious cases of rape. But there are also cases where your rational deliberation might not be fully engaged. Suppose you're drunk, something like that. Now, we would, under most of those circumstances, still say that it's a human action, but that the action performed was, or the choice made, was made uh, maybe earlier in advance. It was the choice to get excessively drunk in a potentially dangerous situation, something like that. If you make the choice to deliberately impede your powers of deliberation in the foreseeable future, and then you place yourself into a situation where you need your powers of deliberation, yeah, that is kind of still your decision. Even if you didn't make the decision fully and properly in the moment, you made it in advance, and you made it poorly in advance. Now, again, this admits of degrees. Because there's a big difference between being a little bit drunk and being unconscious. And there's everything in the middle. And so again, just like anything else here in, in these kinds of analyses, this admits of degree. Now what about lack of deliberation through, say, an intense felt passion? You're, you're swayed by some, uh, some physiological or, or, or mental or emotional passion. And you weren't deliberating thoroughly. And you should have been. Well, in that case, McInerney would say, that, no, no, that is absolutely still human action. You did deliberate. You just stopped the process before you should have. Right? Your deliberation involved the various passions that were going through, uh, going through your mind, etc. You deliberated upon it, and then you stopped before thinking it through to its proper full conclusion. Your, um, your will, so to speak, grasped onto some notion of the good, some ratio boni, but it was a lower good, a lesser good than you ought to have been pursuing, which is why you may go on to re uh, say reconsider your choices later on, because your choice was made not in the light of full reason, in a way that you, you should have thought through more fully and presumably could have. Now I will say as well, the difficulty of thinking through situations in the light of passion is something we'll have to get to later when he starts talking about virtue. Because this is what virtue means. Virtue is, is sort of habituation of action, getting into the right habits of behavior such that doing things uh, doing things that otherwise would be difficult for reasons like this become easier, just by habit. Right? You, you get used to doing something, and then you continue to do it. Uh, so we'll have to kind of uh, hold off on that difficulty in particular. All right. So all that makes sense. Following me still. Any questions on any of this? All right. OK, what else? What else in here do we want to talk about? You said a certain phrase you're speaking. Which one? Oh, peace Eller? So this is the problem. I accidentally speak Latin sometimes. I swear it's not a demon. But... Oh, ratio boni, yes. Uh, ratio boni, that is, that's a term he was using in the previous chapter. Um, ratio meaning nature or character um, or notion. Boni, good. So 
the notion of the good, or bearing the character of the good, or sub rationem bonum, I think, um, means under the notion of the good. Uh, in other words, uh, when you make a choice sub rationem bonum, you are, oh no, so, sorry, sub rationem, yeah, no, sub rationem bonum. You are making a choice by pursuing what good you perceive in it. There's some good that you're pursuing in the choice that you're making, even if it's not the highest good or the ultimate good or the choice you ought or the good you ought to be pursuing. Or it could be, by the way, it could be perfectly well the the highest good, the proper good that you're pursuing, etc. That make sense? Is that good? Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. And again, that's a that's a very good question. It's certainly something to bring up. Okay. What else? What else throughout here do we uh, do we want to discuss, have questions about, or uh, also general thoughts you might have had about the arguments that he makes, stuff we've been discussing? What do you think? Can you explain why Thomas was talking about being and do you have a page number? I think I know what you mean, but okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. All right, so here is first of all, I'm going to uh, I'm going to kind of punt this question first, and then we'll see if we need to expand on it more. What he's doing here is, I take it at least to be. Um, Something like background. Right. So why he's talking about um, our, uh, our apprehension or our understanding of being, being as such, what, what something is, or the existence of things, or what it is for something to be, uh, what it is, how it is for something to exist, etc., is as a description of how we understand things theoretically. So then we can go on to discuss uh, how we understand things practically. Because he has this division between theoretical, theoretical knowledge or theoretical wisdom and then practical knowledge or practical wisdom. And so this, I take this primarily to be a discussion of theoretical knowledge or theoretical wisdom so that we can then go on to sort of analogize it over to, to um, the practical wisdom. Does that help? Is that enough? Or should I go into detail on this? Because I can if you want. OK, sure. Uh, so. He says, uh, OK, so quote, being is the first thing apprehended, an understanding of which is included in whatever else is apprehended. So being, what he means here being about, what he means here by being is being in general, existence, reality. If you recall back when we were talking about the, um, the convertibility of the transcendentals, when we were talking about Anselm, um, being is fundamentally what it means for something to be good, to exist at all, and for it to be true of something, to say something true of something. <coughs> Excuse me. And so when we understand something, some particular thing, like, I don't know, this, part of what we understand is what it is to be this thing. Like what? What, what is this? No, not a rock. It's, uh, it's yeah. No, it's a um, piece of wood. It's a tree trunk, I guess. Like a cut down tree trunk. All right. Okay. So to understand that is to understand, first of all, that this exists. To understand, in order to understand anything about this thing, you have to understand what it means for something to exist, at least in an implicit fashion. Like if I ask questions about this thing, the first thing you have to comprehend is that I'm referring to this when I say this, instead of when I say the word this, that I might be referring to something else entirely. Right? If I say this, you have to understand that my gesture is towards the piece of wood and not this referring to the book or referring to maybe something I'm pointing to with it or something like that. Right? So you have to understand being in that sense. You also have to understand the being of the particular thing. To understand much about this, you have to understand what it is. This is a piece of a tree, a piece of a dead tree. It's a, it's a vertical slice of a tree that 
having counted, having partially counted the rings earlier today, was between 50 and 70 years old when it was cut down. Nice big old tree. And so, okay, we can know certain things about it, but to know that, you have to know certain things about what it is, uh, what wood is, what a tree is, how trees work, things like that. You have to understand the being of the, the kind of thing this is. So abstractly, and not simply about this in particular. So we can abstract away from, say, the, the particular characteristics of picking this up and feeling that it weighs a few pounds and noticing the, the, the sort of rough edges on the thing and stuff like that. And we can expand on that to things like noticing that it's made of wood. Noticing what that means. That, for example, this would probably be relatively flammable because it's dry wood. Knowing certain things abstractly about this type of being comes next. So first of all, we know that it exists. Right? That, that being is uh, that its being is you know real, positive. It, it's there. Then we can narrow down a little bit to know what the being of you know tree bark is. We can know what wood is. We can know things about the being of of wood. What makes something the kind of thing that it is? So we can narrow our focus down a little bit. Then, even more particularly, we can know things about this in particular. I mentioned that this tree was between 50 and 70 years old. I know that because I counted most of the rings and estimated the rest. Because there's a, if you're looking, I don't know if you can see this, probably not, but the rings near the center, which is around here, this is about half of a tree trunk, are very wide. They're probably between a quarter and a half inch wide. Pretty big rings. Then they start to narrow a bit, and then right here, it gets extremely narrow for about that band. What that tells me is this is a very mature tree. Right? I know that because I know something about trees. I know that trees will grow very quickly for the first few years. In this case, quite a few years, actually. Like 30 years or so, they grew pretty quickly. And then they slow down dramatically. And so the rings get narrower. I know that, and I know that that is how this works because I know things about trees in the abstract. And I can apply that knowledge to the particulars of this thing and understand its being. What that means is I know things, say, about the kind of being that this is. OK, so because I know these abstract principles, and I start with the most abstract, being in general, right, that things I predicate of things are, are predicated of them consistently and truly. That to exist at all is to exist in a certain way. And so I then know, well, in what way did this or does this exist? And then I can apply these abstract principles to these slightly less abstract principles and know that, well, if this doesn't, well, if this did exist at some point differently than how it does, which in, in fact is true, this is now a piece of wood, it used to be a piece of a tree. then now I can assess it under, under either of those modes, I guess, as a tree or as a piece of wood. I can say that this would be probably pretty flammable, or I can say that this came from a tree that was 50 to 70 years old. And those are very different things, because I'm thinking of two different beings when I'm, a, when I'm assessing this particular thing. OK, so Another reason that he wants to describe all of this and talk about all of this, like why we understand being, is because he wants to start with the first principles of demonstration. First principles of demonstration are the stuff that we talked about when we talked about logic. The law of non-contradiction, the law of the excluded middle, and Aquinas will add in a few others as well. Things like, uh, things like uh, the, the basic principles of how deductive reasoning works. These are first undeniable principles they have to be assumed in order for us to do thinking clearly. Now, why he's getting into all of this is because when we move from the theoretical, meaning abstract ideas about abstract objects or things considered as objects rather than as, as projects, let's say, rather than as things to do or to make. When we move from one to the other, we have to ask, what are our first principles? What are our abstract first principles of practical reasoning, like we have these logical principles for theoretical reasoning? Now, the logical principles do still apply. The law of non-contradiction, the law of the excluded middle, the law of identity, all of these do 
still apply to discussions of the practical. But we also have these separate first principles of practical reasoning. And the reason for that is because the objects of practical reasoning often, maybe always, I'll waffle on that, at least, at least usually involve theoretical objects, things which are not objects of practical reasoning, so things. So my deliberations about what to do necessarily involves, well, doing what with what, and you know, who and what I am as well. So we need, to, we need to start by thinking about things, things theoretically, then we can start thinking about them practically, then we can apply that to particular things, then we can actually carry them out and do them. This is sort of the process of going from the most abstract to the most particular in terms of ethics. Okay, did that help? Or you have any other specific questions here? Anything else in here that's that's you're not sure about? To clarify some, to, to clarify some terminology, this, uh, that little thing, that means P or not P. So some proposition or some proposition is either true or false. Th this is basically a statement of uh, of the law of the the, uh, uh, the undistributed middle, saying that any given proposition is either true or false. Sorry, that is a that is another one of those things that I'm sorry again. Um, I just read as p or not p, and I just recognize that as a principle of logic that I understand that you might not. I forgot to mention that. Okay, so. Now, if we can go on a little bit, um, he kind of follows this, this route of the, of the transcendentals. So <clears throat> if we begin our theoretical reasoning with being as such, or maybe being qua truth, let's go with that. Uh, qua, again, understood as. Being understood in terms of truth, truth of propositions. Then if we move from the theoretical to the practical, we are now concerned with being qua good. So instead of talking about truth, now we're talking about good. Now again, these sort of co-refer. They're both referring to the being of things, but now we're talking about the goodness of things, and therefore the goodness of actions. How do we do things in a good way and not just be in a good way? And this is the movement from the theoretical to the practical. Uh, small side note. Um, I want to mention briefly his, uh, what he is referring to here, his references. Um, so he's talking here, the main text he's referring to here is, is, is Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologiae. Summa Theologiae is the, it means literally, summary of theology. This was Thomas Aquinas' best known work. Uh, it was probably the, the main text that most people would refer to, and it was also extremely long. Uh, so the, the, the Summa Theologiae was basically a, uh, an introductory theology textbook. Uh, now, introductory might be a misnomer because we probably wouldn't take it as an introductory textbook. Um, partially, that's because uh, education in the 13th century was quite sophisticated, um, but also partially because introductory here was introductory for graduate level studies, not for, you know, say, liberal arts students, the, the equivalent of you know, undergraduate university students. This was for four theology students in particular. Now, it was also quite long. The uh, Summa Theologiae is, oh, here, uh, is made up of either, you can say, two, three, or sorry, either three, four, or five parts, depending on how you want to divide it up. Um, it is the, uh, the prima pars, so the first part, the prima secundae partis, so the, the first part of the second part, the secunda secundae, the second part of the second part, the tertia pars, the third part, and the supplementum tertia partis, the supplement to the third part. So again, quick, quick English translation of all of the Latin titles up there. This, by the way, is where you will go if you want to go directly to and read the Summa in English. So this is a, this is a pretty good translation. Uh, as far as I know, there are, there are a couple of little quibbles I would have here and there, but overall, it'll do the job. Um, and this is also, it has the enormous benefit of being completely free, completely accessible online, and I'll put a link to this over in supplementary materials as well. Um, this is for the whole thing. 
Now, how you navigate to something that he is referring to is an interesting, useful question. So this, st, comma, i, a, i, i, a, e, 0.94.2. Okay. What this means is summa theologiae, prima secundi. So first part of the second part. So let's do that. Prima secundi. And here we have the inner, the table of contents of this section, which you'll notice is quite long. There's a lot here. Uh, the prima secundi has 114 questions uh, into which it's, orga it's organized. All right, then the next number is 94. So question 94, which you'll notice is in the treatise on law, which is 90 through 108, that section. So 94, the natural law. And if we go to that, we might need to refresh. Sometimes it doesn't work. There we go. Okay, you'll notice that there are six articles, one through six. And so here he is referring to two, article two. So then we go to article two. That is more or less how to navigate this. As you noticed along the way, it is very well organized by topic and then by particular question and then by articles within that question. You also might have noticed that it's really long because if, uh, if we note that this is one of the 19 questions that are part of the treatise on law and that there are six separate articles in this question in particular, and that is pretty typical for most of these. Uh, some of them are only, only two or three. Some of them are way more than six. Some of them are like nine or 10. But this is about normal length for a, uh, for a particular question. I have a copy, a separate book of the treatise on law. It's about that thick. If you get a hard copy version of the full Summa Theologiae, I think the, the, uh, the version of it you'll usually find is four volumes, and it's about that big. Um, also, this was far from Aquinas' longest work. That would be the Summa Contra Gentiles, or the Summary of Theology uh, Against the Pagans. So this would be a more in-depth text on a lot of the same topics, um, a lot of which takes into account the arguments presented by not only other Christians, but also um, scholars from, uh, from the Middle East, so uh, also Muslims and Jews as well. And so this is a, uh, a rather international kind of a text, and it's much, much longer, much more in-depth even than this. So why I say all of this is that even just within the Prima Secundi, the first part of the second part, there's a lot in here. And there's a lot to look at. And this can perfectly well be, uh, and uh, say, a secondary source for your paper, somewhere to look for more information or more details or more about the kinds of things that McInerney is talking about here, because he's referring to the treatise on law in general. Now, we can also look to the other parts of this. The, the first part of the second part is more or less the ethical section of the Summa. So, we can talk about ultimate ends. We can talk about human actions and what makes human actions actions. So basically all of the stuff that McInerney has been talking about. So if you do want to look at any more detail on any of this, this would be where to go. Anyway, I digress. Uh, I thought that was vaguely important to kind of walk you through how to, how to look these things up if you need to. All right. So... Um, now, moving from, like I said, moving from the theoretical to the practical. He gives us what he calls the first principle of practical reasoning. Good is to be done, evil is to be avoided. Simple enough. You should do good things and avoid bad things. Now, we need that as a first principle because without a principle like that, you can't really do ethics or practical reason at all. Without the principle that good is something to, to be done, then you don't have conclusions, uh, let's say, in the imperative. So to go back to what, what Lewis was saying, if we remember from C.S. Lewis talking about this, we come to the problem of, uh, of who Lewis called the innovators. So without this principle of good is to be done and evil is to be avoided, and then all of the various other precepts of the natural law as well, we can't come to conclusions about what should be done. We can't come to practical conclusions, only theoretical ones. Okay, so if we go forward here, he wants to, uh, let me see, McInerney lays out a distinction of different degrees of practicality of practical reason. I'm jumping ahead a lot. Oh, wait, no. 
Not that much. I'd have to add too much. No. Where the hell is it? Oh, here it is. Here it is. Hmm. I need to jump back. Sorry. Uh, this is a distinction of practical reason divided into different sort of degrees of practicality. So what parts of our reasoning process are theoretical and what parts are practical? Now all of this, all of what he's talking about here would be considered theoretical reasoning because it is applied. It is not purely theoretical. But he says we can divide practical reason, uh, we can divide our reasoning process uh, in terms of what is theoretical and what is practical into three criteria. The nature of the objects known, so the objects themselves, what objects, what things are we talking about? The way objects are known, or the mode of knowing them, or the intent, purpose, or aim of the knower. What are we trying to figure out about them? What are we trying to do with them? Are we trying to do anything with them, or are we just trying to examine them? Okay, so the objects themselves. So he says, Thomas speaks of theoreticals and operables. So theoreticals are objects of abstract rational speculation and thought. They're not the kinds of things that we do. They're not actions. They're not the kinds of things that we make. They're not artifacts. So this, our piece of wood here, is a theoretical, not an operable. Right? Because this is a natural object, this is just something that, that exists and has come into being. Right? And so because this just sort of exists and has come into being, we can only really think of it in theoretical terms. We can say all sorts of things about it. We can say that it's made of wood. We can say that it weighs a certain amount. We can say that it comes from a certain kind of tree. I don't know. We can say that, uh, that it's starting to crack, presumably due to, uh, due to temperature and moisture differentials and stuff like that. Right? All sorts of things we can say about this. But these are theoretical judgments. These are things that are true about this thing as a thing. Now, the other kind of objects are operables. These are actions and artifacts, things that we do and things that we make. So we could, so we could think instead about, say, a cup of coffee. Right? So a cup of coffee is a thing that human beings do, and it's something with which we interact. It's something that we, say, drink. It's something that we use. And insofar as it is something that we make, and insofar as it is something that we do or something that we use, it is an operable. It is an object of practical reason rather than theoretical reason. Now, if it is only the object which is an operable, if it is only the object which is, which is practical, let's go, if we uh, go down here, and we are thinking about it in a theoretical way, and we are not intending to use it in particular, or make it in particular, then we call this virtually practical knowledge. Yes, it is a thing. We can consider the nature of the thing. And the nature of that thing is going to be, in some sense, conditioned by uh, the fact that it is made by human beings for human use. Right? A cup of coffee is made in a certain way. Insofar as that is true, I can make it, or I can have made it well or poorly. There are certain things that we can know theoretically about it. So this gets to the second step, the mode of knowing. If we are thinking about the operable thing, this, this object of practical reason, but if we are thinking about it with our theoretical reason, then what I'm thinking about is, say, the caffeine content of this, its temperature, um, how full it is, its, its overall mass, um, whether it, uh, what it tastes like, what it smells like, all that kind of stuff, right? If, I'm, if instead I am thinking about it, my mode of knowing is practical, if I'm thinking about it practically, then what I'm thinking about is, how did I do making it? Did I make it well? Or did I make it poorly? Then or, and or, I suppose, thinking about what can it be used for? Is this going to be good if I drink it? 
good both in terms of taste, flavor, whatever, but then also good in terms of what is it good for? Is it going to be refreshing? Is it going to be bitter? Is it going to be, uh, is it going to be uh, properly caffeinating? All of these other various, uh, various things. Right? If I am thinking about it practically, then I'm thinking about what is it doing? What is it good for? All right, we call that that sort with, with a an object of practical reasoning thought about in a practical way, but that I am not actively either making or doing something with. We think of this as formally practical knowledge. That's his, that's his term here. Now, completely practical knowledge of the thing is then embodying that practical wisdom into action. That's drinking it. Actually drinking it, actually making it, etc. That is the the. We're no longer thinking about it at all. We're just doing now. And so, because the third aspect of this fully, uh, or I guess completely practical knowledge, this is just embodied in action. That isn't the domain of ethical study. Ethics studies the first two: what makes things good in themselves, and then what is uh, what is a good way of interacting with them or good way of making them. Now, this in particular is water, so it's not very good coffee. If we think about it theoretically in the abstract, we can say that this is poor coffee because it has a vague coffee-ish flavor having been put in a coffee cup, but otherwise it's cool water. We can say that it is not going to do the things that I would like coffee to do for me. It's not going to taste like coffee, it's not going to warm me, and it's not going to caffeinate me very much at all. Now, it might provide, you know, it might quench a thirst, which is something that coffee is vaguely supposed to do, but not even that thoroughly. Right? So we can, we can pass negative judgment on this qua coffee. But I can still, knowing all of that, drink it, though knowing what it is, I would be drinking it qua water, not coffee. Because if I were trying to drink coffee, if that were what I were aiming to do, because of what I know about this from in terms of my, my practical reasoning applied to this, if I were in fact trying to drink coffee, is that is what I, if that is the, the task I was setting out to accomplish, I wouldn't drink this. But instead, knowing what it is, knowing its, knowing its various qualities and its various, uh, what's good about it, what it's good for, et cetera, I can drink it because I'm trying to drink water. And I can do so successfully. Not perfectly successfully, because it still kind of tastes a little bit like coffee, because it's in my coffee cup but I can still successfully drink water in this case because I know what it is and I know what it's for and I can follow that, follow through on that. Okay, pretty good, good so far. Following, questions? Quick question, we all understood this distinction between desirable one and desirable two, right? Because he's gonna make a lot out of that distinction later on. We get that? I'll go over it briefly and make sure. So briefly, desirable one, just like when he makes the distinction between moral one and moral two, desirable one is just the fact that something can be desired at all. Desirable two is that something ought to be desired. Right? That there is something that, that, there's something about something which is worth desiring or worth pursuing. So it's, again, the difference between an apparent good, desirable one, something that we do in fact pursue, and a real or a true good, something that is actually conducive to our own flourishing or our own well-being. Make sense? Again, it's a simple enough distinction, but it's something that I wanted to draw attention to. Um, he makes a lot of these distinctions, by the way. Um, so do most of the medievals that he is referring to, and so naturally. Um, I mean, Anselm makes, made one of these distinctions in the section that we read on truth. In the next one, he's gonna be making a couple of more. Um, of distinctions very much like this. Uh, another one that we can look at a distinction very much like this, again, to, to sort of illustrate the point, is the difference between visible and visible. Hmm. What do we mean by say, to, what do we mean when we say that something is visible? You can see it. That's one of them. And the other one's like, it is apparent? Mm, that's, that's metaphorically. I mean literally. If we're talking about uni univocal predication, predicating something the same way, meaning something in the same way, what is 
the other way in which we mean visible, aside from we can see it. Question. There's water in this cup, right? As I've just talked about and explained. Is it visible? No. Is it? We know it's there, but we can't see it. Is it visible, though? So, no in one sense. But there's another, another, I think, fairly obvious sense in which, yes, it is visible. In contrast, in contrast to invisible, right? We would not say that the water is invisible. It is, in fact, visible in the sense that it could be seen, right? If you could see it, it would be seen. That's another way of saying that something is visible. Do you mean that as it is transparent? No, it's when you're saying invisible, or that we wouldn't know without you telling us that there's water in there. It exists. Yeah. Not just exists. I mean, there are things that are that exist but are not visible. Um, so if you not know quite that. Water in the cup. Does that make it visible, even though we can't see the water? Is that what you're okay? Saying? Can you see water? Yes, you can see water. Yes. Okay. So water is visible. Yes. This is water, right? Yes. It's visible. Because it's there. Yes. In the sense that it is the kind of thing that you can detect with your eyeballs. But there's this other sense that is probably more intuitive. I say, is something visible? We also might just mean, can you in fact see it? Like, whether it's opaque or not? Yeah, right. Or not even opaque, but just like, can you detect it with your eyes? Okay. Now, can you detect it with your eyes? Meaning, is it the kind of thing which could be detected visibly? Which water is yes, right? If you could, in other words, look. Okay, observe. This is a very waterproof carpet, don't worry. You saw it, right? It's, yeah. Okay. That means it was visible all along. It could be seen. It is not invisible. Okay, great. So in that sense, it is visible. But right now, it is not visible in the sense that you can't see it because there's something in the way, right? OK, that's the distinction. That's another one of these kinds of distinctions. And it's very similar here to desirable one versus desirable two. Something could be desirable insofar as it is in fact desired. That's like visible insofar as it is in fact seen versus desirable in the sense that it is the kind of thing that there is something about it which ought to be desired. It has a certain property that is a property of it rather than a relational property that I have to it. right? So that would be like visible in the sense of it is the kind of thing that can reflect light rays such that our eyes can pick it up. It has a certain abstract or theoretical congruence between the visible thing and our sensory apparatuses. Just like the desirable to thing is the kind of thing that has a certain kind of congruence between our will and the thing. It is the kind of thing that our will is naturally or ought to be inclined towards, whether it is or in fact or not. Question. Can you restate the definition for desirable one and two? Yes. So desirable one is that we in fact desire it. Okay. It is the, it is to expand on this a bit. It is the kind of thing, whether it is good or not, that we perceive or act as if it is good. It's an apparent good. Right? Or a real good. So it's, it's, it's a good which is either apparent or real. There's something that we are desiring about it. That's desirable one. one. Desirable two is that which ought to be desired, that which is worth desiring, that there's something actually good about it. It's an actual good. But isn't that subjective? No. No, 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 no. Remember the cat poop example? Right. Okay. <laughs> there's, so to clarify, there is nothing desirable to about a nice steaming plate of cat poop. I have two cats, trust me. But if there's something wrong with you, or if you are in a particular very bizarre situation, 
or in a particular very bizarre mental state, or whatever, you might in fact desire one cat poop. See what I mean? Okay. The point of this is that desire one is entirely subjective. Desire two is absolutely not. It is a quality of the thing itself, not of our relationship to it. How do you distinguish if something is a serpent too? You look at whether it is in fact conducive to human flourishing. Right? So it's, it is, uh, this is what natural law is all about. This is why we've been talking about natural law in general, that, that we look at the precepts of natural law to figure out whether something is, whether something ought to be pursued or not. And if it ought to be pursued, then it's desirable in this second sense, desirable too. If it, uh, and so in other words, if it is in fact conducive to human flourishing, if it would in fact perfect the agent pursuing it, then it's desirable too. It is actually the kind of thing that should be desired. If it would only seem to perfect the agent, but wouldn't actually, then it's only desirable one insofar as it is desired, but under a mistaken understanding of what it is and maybe what the agent is, what we are, in other words. Okay. All right, does that make sense? Yes. All right. I want to look at uh, one more little distinction that he makes. We've got 10 minutes left. I think I can go over it. Okay, so when he goes into precepts of the natural law. So first of all, he says that all of the various precepts of the natural law are derived from and particularized versions of good is to be done and evil is to be avoided. So that's our first principle. That's our starting place. But the various other precepts are applying that incredibly broad principle to particular concrete situations or even applying them to slightly less broad, but still abstract situations, right? So for example, there are various, so we already talked about the, uh, the, the, the what, the, the rational, uh, the rational actions which we uh, share with animals, the animal actions that we do in a rational way, that sort of thing, right? These are, if I can find where he's talking about this, these are things that we ought to order and direct towards, uh, towards human ends. So we might say that good is to be done and evil is to be avoided. That's very abstract, almost uselessly so. But we also might say that we ought to pursue we ought to pursue animal ends in such a way as they fulfill our human ends without undermining their animality. That's a principle. It's a slightly narrowed version of good is to be done, evil to be avoided, because now we're looking at what good means in the context of a rational animal doing animal things rationally. So we ought to pursue animal ends, pursue them as properly animal ends, but pursue them in a higher rational way. So in a way that, that harmonizes these two aspects of ourselves rather than putting them into conflict. Okay, that's a principle. That's a precept. Okay, but then we can go even more precise, more specific. We can talk about particular ends, both rational, strictly rational ends and animal ends. And so in these, in these particular kinds of principles, we find that there are positive and negative principles. So positive principles being like thou shalt negative principles being thou shalt not. And we also find that some of these principles are absolute or universal. They apply in all or at least almost all cases. And we find that some of them are particular or situational. And most of the time, the negative precepts turn out to be universal or absolute. And the positive precepts tend to be more situational. So he goes through some of this in, on uh, 48, it says. So he talks about the negative precepts. Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not cover thy, neighbor, thy neighbor's wife. So why not? We can ask why these precepts are universally applicable. He says, because such actions are everywhere, uh, wait, sorry, because such actions always and everywhere thwart the human ideal. There is no way that you can murder well, steal well, commit adultery well, except metaphorically. So these are negative precepts. Do not do this because in every possible case, 
doing so is not conducive to human flourishing. It is contrary to our human ends. It is contrary to our human nature. There's no way to do it right. In other words, you know, murder, theft, and adultery, among others. Now he talks about the positives, such as be temperate, be just, be generous. These are always applicable, but how they apply varies a lot based on your particular situation. So we say, be temperate. So temperance is the virtue of doing something, especially with respect to pleasures, just the right amount. Not depriving yourself, but not also not going to excess. Great example of this, because temperance, we typically associate this with drinking alcohol, just because of the temperance movement historically. But it's a good example. Temperance, with respect to, say, drinking alcohol, is drinking the right amount so as not to go to excess, but also not to deprive yourself unnecessarily. And for different people in different situations, that might be more or it might be less. For me, to drink temperately right now, the correct amount is zero. That applies to all of us because we're in a class, right? However, fast forward a couple of hours, and I'm, at, I, and I'm, say, hanging out with some friends, the right amount might be a few drinks. That also might differ, though, because for some of my friends, they might have a significantly higher alcohol tolerance than I do, and so they might drink a few more. And that might be perfectly temperate for them, because again, it's not going to go to excess. Now, some of my other friends might, for example, be recovering alcoholics. And the right amount for them to drink ever is zero, because they know that one drink will almost necessarily set them off onto sort of a spiral. And so the, the correct amount for temperance, whether that's alcohol or anything else, might vary wildly from person to person, or situation to situation. But we all still should be temperate. Same applies to justice, right? Justice will largely depend upon obligations to each other, particular social situations and things like that. Same applies to generosity. It might depend on what you have and the people around you and what they need and things like that too. Right? So these positive precepts, while they are universal, they apply very differently depending on particular situations. Whereas negative precepts always apply in basically the same way. Now there's a caveat to this. There's always a caveat to this. Always, every time there has to be. Because if you say murder is always wrong, what might be an exception to that? Anybody? Or what might seem like an exception to that? Would well, self-defense still count as murder? It seems like it, but no. Right, and, and this is why this is why we say that these negative precepts do apply universally in just the same way. Because it seems like this would prohibit self-defense, or this would prohibit at least killing in self-defense, but it certainly does not. And here's why. So the action of murder is the direct, deliberate, and intentional killing of a human being. So again, remember, rational, right? rational human action, rational, deliberate, and free. You've chosen to do so. It is your end, the end goal you have in mind, and you've considered it and you've thought it through. This is very different from self-defense because in a case of self-defense, killing someone is not your end. It is not what you are pursuing. It is incidental to what you are pursuing. So what are you pursuing in, in a case of self-defense? What are you trying to do? Yourself. You're trying to stop someone from hurting you. And if the only way of doing that results in them dying, fine, right. You, in, you have succeeded in what you were trying to do, which was defend yourself. You have not killed them. They've died as a result of your actions. It's very different. Think of the, uh, think of the golf example, McInerney's golf example. This is a little bit different than that, but it's still the same kind of reasoning still applies. If you, uh, if you wind up, say, killing someone in self-defense, here's how you can figure out if you were, if you were intentionally, or intentionally or deliberately killing them or not. If you had not killed them, would you, could you still have succeeded at what you were trying to do? If the answer is yes, you weren't trying to kill them. Right, so suppose you know someone, someone like, 
tries to rob you, breaks into your house and tries to rob you. And you, like, you draw your gun and you fire off a bunch of rounds in their general direction. You happen to miss with all of them, and they run away. Perfectly reasonable. OK, now, if you had said, damn, I missed, then you were trying to kill the guy. And that was attempted murder. If you said, oh, thank god, he's gone, then you were trying to defend yourself in your home. Because you were clearly trying to do something, and whether the guy died or not is incidental to whether you accomplished your goal or not. Okay, so again, it largely depends on what you were attempting to do. Now, the question will still arise, and we'll have to get to it eventually, as to what means are just, or what, what additional foreseeable consequences are just and permitted for doing certain actions, like defending yourself. Is it, under what circumstances is it, is it permissible to defend yourself in a way that leads to the death of somebody else? Another separate question that we'll have to get to two chapters from now? Might be the next chapter. Things like this. This relies on some other principles. Anyway, that's all the time we got for this chapter, or this half of this chapter. So next time, uh, we're going to look at the second half of this chapter, which is on a couple of controversies, one being the fact-value dichotomy, or, the, or what I call the is-ought pseudo problem in the syllabus. That and also questions of relativism. So we're going to look at both of those. Uh, that is the second half of chapter three. So from the second half, the, the bottom half of page 50 onwards. And then next Thursday, we're going to look at chapter four. And that'll get us out through spring break. So have a good weekend. See you next time. Bye-bye.